Good morning, church. And happy Sabbath to each one of you. And I always grateful to be here and worship with you. And the, my one of my favorite part coming to Rock Island Church and worshiping with you is you know the singing. I love the singing. Thank you, all the singer for leading us very spiritual uh, singing. And also, I just want to thank all of you for being here today. And um, to those who are going to join us later, or whether through video, YouTube video, I welcome you too. I just want to remind you uh, that when we come to worship, when we come to the secret place in the house of God, we are not here to just listen to the word of God, but to encounter Christ, to encounter God. So I pray that may the Holy Spirit speak to each one of us in a very and a personal way. Our message today is so close yet so far. Probably you might wonder what it's all about. So close yet so far. There are moments in life being so close is not enough. Being so close is not enough. In 1954, 1954, a man by the name of James Peter, who was a marathon runner, competing in a marathon race in Vancouver, Commonwealth Games. He was on his way winning the race. He ran already 26 mile equivalent 42 kilometer with the finish line jet inside. Peter James, James Peter collapsed from severe dehydration and exhaustion. He reached to the stadium first, 17 minutes before all the runners and 10 minutes ahead of the world record. He's just about to win. He's already saw the finish line, but Peter fell down because of severe dehydration and exhaustion. Peter was so close to the victory, but at the end he was still unable to cross the finish line, remain so far. The next runner by the name of Brian Houston overtook him and won the race. So close, yes, so far. Let's pray. Dear Father, teach us through this message. Use me in a very powerful way. I'd empty myself, my mind, fill me with your power, with the Holy Spirit. Speak to your people in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. There was a story in the Bible about a young man who was much like this runner. He claimed he came so close to the finish line, but because something held him back and he couldn't finish the race. Let's turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 22. Mark chapter 10, 17 to 22. I'm reading a New King James Version. You can follow me through all on the screen, um, which is in King James Version. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running near before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do? I may have eternal life. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear for witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, how many things? One thing you lack. 
Go away and sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. Verse 22, but he was sad at his word. Went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. This is the same story that we can find in other gospel. In the gospel of um, Luke 18 and the gospel of Matthew chapter 19, we find the same story. And all three gospels provide additional information about this man who has come to be known as the rich young man. Matthew told us he was young. You did a wonderful thing. And Luke told us that he was rich. And all three gospels told us that he was the ruler. It's probably mean the ruler of the synagogue. He was the man of power and authority, position in religious environment, in, in religious community. When we consider all these facts given about this man, it is clear to us that this young man had many great advantages in life. From every outward appearance, this man was the ideal man. This man was the exemplary man. He was young, he was rich, and not just that, he was religious. You remember when Jesus asked, do you, you know the commandment? And, and he said, I know I kept them from my youth. He was religious. He was religious too and morally clean. He was the envy of everyone. But, you know the word but, I hate but, <laughs> sometimes. He had the problem. This man carried the problem. This man carried the burden in his heart. All that he has unable to give him what he wants the most, which is what? Peace. There is no peace in his heart. There is no peace in his heart. From every hour appearance, he made it. He had youth. He has money. He is the leader. He has authority. He has position. But all that he has, unable to give him something that he desperately need, desperately want. If that the, if, is that the current situation that you have? Just like this man, probably you have it all. But you have peace, peace with God in your heart. Please continue to listen to the story. This young man came to Jesus, according to the book of Mark. Came to Jesus, he got many things right. He got many things right, several things right. The first thing he got is right, he came to the what? To the right person. He came to Jesus. He probably evidently heard of Jesus and he knew that if anyone could help him, it might be Jesus. That's why he came to Jesus. He got it right. He came to Jesus. The second thing he got is right. He came in the right manner. How did he come to Jesus? He ran, right? He ran. He came running. He came running to Jesus because he knew, he knew that his situation, his problem was urgent. You know, nothing in life is urgent as your salvation, friend. This is a serious issue. We should make the issue of our salvation urgent. Urgent above everything else. Because we don't know what is our tomorrow. The scripture says you don't know what happened, what will happen tomorrow. 
There are many folks, there are many people who went to bed last night and didn't wake up this morning. We don't know what is our tomorrow. That is why we need to make sure where are we going to end up after this short life. Our salvation is urgent. We need to come run into Jesus. And the third thing, he got his right. He also came to Jesus and kneeled before Jesus. This showed that he recognized the fact that he was a broken person. He may have everything but spiritually broken. He was broken. He recognized that he was a sinner and who desired to humble himself before Jesus. This is a very important point too, friend. We need to recognize our true condition. That we are broken, we are sinner, who are in great need of Jesus. Who can save us from our desperate and hopeless situation? He got it right too. And the fourth thing, he got it right. He came for the right purpose. You remember he came? He has the most important question to us, to Jesus. What is his question? What should I do to have eternal life? What must I do to have eternal life? He has the most important question to us. He got it right there. He got it right again. This is the most serious question in life that everyone should ask. What must I do to have eternal life? I believe you know the answer. I believe you know the answer. And the fifth thing, he got his right. He came at the right time. He came at the right time. He came when Jesus walked past. This is a mistake many people make. They think that they can come to God anytime. The truth of the matter is, we don't come to God whenever we like. We can only come to Jesus, come to God when God is calling us. You know, when you are here, come to this place, God is speaking to your heart and you respond to it. God is the one who initiates the process coming to him. A lot of people reject that calling. In the book of Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6. The book of Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6. Seek the Lord when he may be what? Found. Seek the Lord when he may be found. And call upon him when he is what? Near. Near. We need to take that opportunity. When the Spirit speaks to our heart, we need to respond it, friend. We need to respond it. And another verse in John chapter 6, verse 44. John chapter, first, uh, chapter 6, verse 44. No one come to me unless the Father, what? Who sent me draw him. Listen to that word. No one come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. See that? We don't come to go whenever we like we come to God when he is calling us. So friend, please come when he's calling you. So friend, come when he is passing by, when we still have time. Please come when you still have opportunity. Remember, I just mentioned it to you. Nobody knows what is our tomorrow. Even the next hours. We don't know what is out tomorrow. Please come when you have opportunity. This man get many things right, several things right. Unfortunately, he gets the main thing terribly wrong. Terribly wrong. We go back to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. 
when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asking, Good master, what should I do? I may have eternal life. Good master, listen to the word. Good master, what should I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why thou call me good? There is no one good but that is what? God. Notice the verse 17. Good master, what should I do that I may have eternal life? That this man called Jesus good. And Jesus, Jesus reminded him, why you call me good? There is no one good but God. The statement that Jesus made to this man was designed to make this young man to consider how he viewed Jesus. How he viewed Jesus. Obviously, this man only believe and know that Jesus is good teacher. This is one of the biggest problems this man had. Before he or anyone can come to Jesus, they must have a clear understanding of who Jesus is. Right? Jesus is not just man, a good teacher, a good prophet. The scripture is quite clear this morning we, in Sabbath school lesson, we talk about divinity of Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen? Jesus is God. That's why Jesus, Jesus said to him, why you call me good? I am not just man. I'm not just a prophet. I'm not just a good teacher who came to show the way. I am God. I am God who can save you. And Jesus said to him, you know the commandment, do not commit adultery, do not, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear for witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he, ans he, he answered to Jesus, all this I have kept from my youth. And verse 21, what happened? Jesus behold him and what? Loved him. Jesus behold him and loved him. Jesus still loved this man regardless of his misunderstanding of the spiritual thing. Regardless of his misplaced priority in life, Jesus still loved him. You know what's from that is gospel. Jesus loved you and me regardless of how, he, how, he, how we view him. Regardless how messed up we are, regardless how terrible we sing, in the past, Jesus loved you and me. Jesus looked at him and loved him. As the proof of his love, Jesus told this young man how to be saved. Jesus told him how many things, anybody remember? In the test? Jesus told him three things. Thank you, my brother Peter. There's a part of it too. Jesus told him three things. And Jesus told him, number one, to sell his possession and give his money to what? To where? To the poor. That's the first thing Jesus told him. Go and sell your possession and give your money to the poor. Jesus is not suggesting that salvation is earned by our good words. Salvation earned by our uh, good deeds or giving out your money. Jesus is not suggesting none of that. Jesus is merely placing his finger on this man at this man's problem. This rich man loves his money. He follow his money. He want his money more than he wants God. By telling this man, go and sell your possession and give your money to the poor, Jesus is telling him, if you want me, what? You can place nothing as before me. That's it. 
You cannot place your money before me. You, can, you cannot place anything before me. Otherwise, you cannot come to me to be safe. You need to give the right, your right priority. You need to get it right. And the second thing he told, he told to this man, sell your possession and give the money to the poor. And the second thing he said, take up your, take up the cross. Take up the cross. What does the cross symbolize? The cross, what a symbol of death, right? Take up the cross was to choose death, to choose death. So Jesus is simply saying, if you want me, you have to die yourself. Die yourself. In other words, your love, your desire, your plan that you have must be given up before you choose to come to me. And the third thing that he told this man, and we all know, what is it? Take up the cross and then follow me, follow me. Jesus is saying to this man, stop following other temporary things of the world. Not your money, not your wealth, not your possession. Keep that behind and follow me. Turn everything your back. You turn your back in all that you have love and follow me. That's how you get eternal life. <coughs> and this, the saddest part of the story is we find it in Mark chapter 10, verse 22. And he was sad that it's saying that he went away grief, for he had what? Great possession. That is the saddest part of the whole encounter with Jesus. The whole encounter with Jesus. That is the saddest part. This young man makes his decision, which is the tragic decision, which is the earthly decision. He chooses his worldly possession over Jesus. He loved his money more than he wanted to be saved. This is the lesson for you and me to take today, friend, to take home today. Jesus will allow every one of us, every single choice we make. It may not be the money. Some people love money. Jesus let, it, just let them to choose. It may not be the money. It may be pleasure or it may be some sin. If you want to keep it, Jesus will let you keep it. Jesus will not force you. He can only invite you and beg you, but he cannot force you. That is one in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Mark 8, 36 and 37. It is worthy, it is really worth more than eternal life. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? The whole story was summarized by Ellen White in the book of Desire Ages. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Ellen White emphasized that this young man was sincere. He is the truth seeker. He came to Jesus. With the right purpose. He, he, he was sincere, but he lacked complete surrender. You may be sincere. You may be honest. But a lot of us are struggling with complete surrender. Jesus loved this man and longed to give him eternal life. But the problem with this man was that his heart was divided. His hearts were divided. And Jesus summed up the whole story of this man's dilemma. One thing thou lack. This man have everything, not the most important things. He have everything, but he lacked Jesus. He was so close, 
yet so far. Does this describe you? Do you have money? Do you have possession? Do you have youth? Do you have beauty? Do you have health? Do you have power, education? Or anything as you can name, or but do you have Jesus in your life? Do you still like Jesus? Friend, please don't go away for another minute without Jesus. Jesus is speaking to your heart right now. He's speaking to you and he's inviting all of us to come to him, to recommit our life to him through this holy communion. Through communion. Don't let your encounter with Jesus today, right now, become a tragic one day. Don't walk away, Jesus. Don't walk away, Jesus. Don't let anything to hold you back, whether your pride, whether unforgiving spirit, whether resentment, don't let anything hold you back today to recommit your life to Jesus. Just like this man, he came and ran and knee before Jesus. Let us do the same. Let us humble ourselves before Jesus. Now it's time to divide for foot washing ceremony. Thank you.